I don't get it. I don't get the attraction to it. I would never come here as a tourist. I would like to coin shirts that say Gabon Gablos. I think this is one of the worst. First of all, it doesn't look any different. If you look around, like there are not gorillas and monkeys swinging from the trees like I expected. It looks like your basic South Florida, Jamaica, Puerto Rico. It's a beach. It's all right. Every season of Survivor is a story, but sometimes that story can be told over the course of multiple seasons. Some players will have two-part stories, while others can play four or even five times and have a much longer tale. Why do some players rise and fall and never recover, while others can fall and still get back up and succeed? Today, we're going to see the rise and fall of the notorious villain, Corinne Kaplan, who first played on season 17, Survivor Gabon. 39 days, 18 people, one Survivor. Corinne Kaplan, a 29-year-old pharmaceutical saleswoman from California, was a castaway on Survivor's 17th season, Survivor Gabon. The show finally made the leap to HD, and what a world of difference this makes as they are visiting Africa for the second time in the show's history, and the cast we have here are 18 newbies. We learn that Exile Island is back with a hidden immunity idol being there, and we then meet our 18 castaways, including Corinne. Hi everybody, I'm Corinne and I do pharmaceutical sales. I'm gonna be a total bitch and I'm gonna get rid of who I have to get rid of and I'm gonna hurt people's feelings and I'm gonna laugh when people cry and I'm gonna own it. Well then, Corinne, when she talks out loud, seems to be nice to everyone. But I don't know how often we have someone be this crass and purposefully evil in their first confessional. Jeff then says the two oldest players here, Bob and Jillian, will be in charge of drafting the two tribes why are they doing this? They have attempted this exact twist in season five Thailand and it bombed. And then they tried again in seasons 10 and 14 and it doesn't work. It never works. But like a stubborn mule, they're doing it again. Corinne lands on Coda, AKA Bob's tribe, AKA the tribe that seems to be clearly stacked and actually made their selections in a smart manner to win challenges. However, Fong, the opposing tribe, does have Crystal, the Olympic runner, who says she's gonna win with her blazing fast speed. Their first challenge is to run across this beautiful land and up a hill. Whichever tribe does this first wins. In surprising fashion, Coda wins, and the last person to cross the finish line is Crystal, the Olympic runner. Wow. At the Coda camp, they work hard to build a shelter, and Corinne says, this Bob guy is actually kind of great. Bob, he's just like the forever boy scout. Go Bob, go Bob. Let's just give him some moral support. Bob, he's totally like, he gets it together. He's got the camp running really smoothly. He's 57 years old and he's awesome. You know, after her first confessional, I didn't think we would hear her compliment people, especially in confessional. So that's nice. Coda then goes on to win immunity in dominating fashion, but this premiere episode is a two hour double header. So the next day at camp, Marcus, AKA Survivor's ideal perfect winner choice, says he likes Corinne and he wants to be in an alliance with her. And I think Corinne, like, I actually really like her. I think at this point, it's looking like the, the large onion alliance, as I might call it. Myself, Charlie, Jackie, Corinne is, is what we're shooting for. And I think Corinne is probably the smartest one in the round. I like hanging out with you. And like, I think it would be great to have like a smaller layer of the yeah. group. I think we have a really good chance. Like, I would like the alliance to be like me, you, and Jackie, tight, strong, Charlie, and then just have like one like like looser person. And then we just need a peripheral one extra person to be in the majority and Bob is really benign, like everyone likes him. Mind you, the Onion Alliance actually originated season two, but here's the first time someone has used this analogy to explain it. Coda then goes on to win immunity again because Fong is just that big of a mess and that's it for the premiere episode. So far, we've seen Coda dominate challenges so hard that Fong is actually getting all the screen time because they are a hot, hot mess. But what we did see of Corinne was someone who promises to be a villain and also gets into an alliance with who the show is telling us is the smartest person here. So is Corinne on the path to be a final three loser? 
Maybe, let's find out. By the way, if you wanna pick what subjects I cover, including story videos, rankings, and even amazing race content, then consider supporting this channel on Patreon. Our show is patron supported, and that's why you don't see sponsors in any of these videos, as the patrons are the ones with the power to dictate what videos are made. If this interests you, then check out the link in the description. Thank you for your support. Episode 2 sees a strange turn of events for Coda as they actually lose the reward challenge to the hot mess that is Fong. Weird. Sugar is then sent to Exile Island from their tribe, and back at camp we see Corinne and Bob talk. They say Paloma will be the first voted out, followed by Sugar, but in bigger news, Bob agrees to be aligned with Corinne. Score. Hold on though, don't be drinking anything during this next statement. Are you ready? Coda loses immunity. I know, what the heck, how did that even happen? If it makes you feel better, Fong has been way overeating their supply of rice, so that could be part of it. Sugar then arrives back at camp and says, I did not find the immunity idol on Exile, and people believe her, and why shouldn't they? Sugar is perceived as weak, and it is only episode two. Yule, I believe, is the only person to have actually found the idol in episode two of their season, so Sugar's no Yule. The debate then rages on between voting off Paloma or Ace. Ace is this arrogant guy with a questionable British accent. Corinne says she isn't even sure if that accent is real, but she knows come emerge, he's gonna flip on them. And actually, Corinne is dead on. He will absolutely flip at any moment, so he needs to be a target for them. At Tribal Council, they all go to vote, and Paloma is gone in a 7-2 elimination. Paloma, Tribal Spoken. <laughs> Episode 3 brings with it a twist, a tribe swap that sees Corinne stay on Coda with Bob, Marcus, and Charlie. Perfect for her as they have a 4-3 lead over the old Fong. Those old Fong members are Randy, Susie, and Dan. They do win immunity, so we move on to episode 4 where we see Coda catching fish and eating well. But then they go to the reward challenge where they use some innovative thinking to try and win. Survivors are ready. Go! Corinne with the left-handed toss gets denied. Maddie is working, Charlie. Another big Maddie to Kenny connection. That combination is giving Fong a big lead right now. Got it. Huge pineapple caught by Kenny. And on that left hand, there it is. Both baskets look pretty full. Two, one. That's it. Challenge is over. 16 pounds for Fong. Not bad. By two pounds, Coda wins the war. Which member of Fong are you sending to Exile Island? Might as well have your mail forwarded there, because Sugar's going again. <laughs> and why sending Sugar again? No strategy, pur purely comedy. <laughs> Did Dan really just say that when sending the Sugar to Exile for the third time in a row? Yeah, he did, and wow. Coda does win immunity, so in episode five, the food is becoming a situation for them. You see, Dan eats five servings a meal, and this is Survivor, so uh, that's not how things are supposed to work. Their rice supply is dwindling fast. Everyone is annoyed by this. They do win reward where surprisingly the Olympic runner on Fong, Crystal, drops out weird. I guess she isn't that great at running after all. With that reward comes pastries and back at camp everyone is like I guess we need to ration these or Dan will eat them all. Though they don't tell Dan that's why they're doing it but uh that's the real reason. He seems to be the most hated of the old Fong. They do win immunity so in episode 6 the Dan hate continues as he's kind of just being an awkward duck. I wanted to clarify that I'm like a really sensitive person yeah. and, and it's weird when I'm not part of a group. I would know? say that Dan is socially inept in a lot of ways. I don't know if he's a former fatty or why he wasn't liked as a child, but deep down inside, he's a little kid that's seeking approval. They do win reward, and Sugar is sent to exile for a record fifth time in a row. And with that, the reward not only comes with a cool helicopter flight, but also letters from home, which makes Bob cry and Corinne be extra nice to him. So I guess Corinne's just not gonna be a villain. I'm so confused. We then learn that no matter what, both tribes are going to tribal council and back at camp, Marcus says he wants Charlie, Corinne, and Randy with him in the final four. 
Bob has now been excluded from the group. Great for Corinne, but even better for Marcus when you think about it. Whether he sits next to Charlie, Corinne, or Randy at this point in the game, he's gonna win. It's not even close. They then talk about whether to vote off Susie or Dan next, and we all know about Dan, but let's catch up on Susie. You see, she has been a quiet, hard worker who they suspect is less likely to flip than Dan, come emerge. But then, in a plot twist, Susie talks to Corinne and says, Okay, I want to be honest with you. I was actually going to vote you. Because. Why? Because I know that I'm a hard worker. I, I know that without having fire and water and food, how are you going to perform physically? You're going to have to take that time to do that work. Mm -hmm. So this moron has decided that she'd like me to go. Really? I hate her. I hate her, hate her, hate her. I'm like, I really want to stab her in the face. And if you piss me off, you've pissed off my alliance. Ah, there is the evil Corinne she promised to be. But I think what Susie just said is everything they need to know about her future intentions. You see, Dan has openly expressed loyalty and they actually found this annoying and said, he's doing it too obviously. Obviously, this means he's going to flip on us come emerge because he's just being too loyal. But Susie has been quiet and here she actually makes her true feelings known and Corinne is mad and says, we're voting off Susie next. So a tribal council, Jeff asks about who is strong in this tribe, and Susie says, well, I think I'm stronger than Corinne physically. And Corinne, while keeping a fake smile on her face, says, oh, oh yeah, maybe. But she is livid. So they all go to vote, and... First vote. Susie. 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 Dan. 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 Eighth person voted out of Survivor Gabon. Dan. Dan? Travis spoken. Happy to go. I am baffled. Corinne voted off Dan and not Susie. That was the one vote difference. They suspected Dan might have an idol that he got when he went to exile in episode one, but Susie just said she isn't loyal. I don't get it. But with episode seven, people suspect the merge is coming very soon, and they all commit to being the final six and Pagong the remaining four Fong members of the other tribe. This will be a piece of cake. Corinne says, you better believe Susie is going to pay. Just not this moment, just down the line, she's gonna pay. After what Susie said at last night's tribal, I plan on burying her as soon as possible, alive. I am an extremely vindictive person and I will get my revenge. It took Susie cracking her, but Corinne is finally being the villain she promised to be. They then get tree mail which says, Go to the beach and bring only your personal possessions. Sounds like a merge to me. We then see everyone enjoying a large feast and they see that a box is on the table. It says, don't open me until you're done feasting so we can continue the game. AKA it probably contains the new merge buffs. Since no one wants to merge quite yet, they enjoy their time until Kenny spots a note on the table and Marcus reads it out loud. As it turns out, it's a clue to a hidden immunity idol hidden right here on their beach. Randy finds the idol fast, and since Coda feels like they have this game in the bag, him and Marcus just chuck it in the ocean. Now they ask everyone if they want the idol, and everyone says no, though some people clearly want it. So they, yeah, they just chuck it right in the ocean. They then open the box with the new buffs, and... Congratulations, you have just divided yourself into two new tribes. I thought there were gonna be 10 new buffs in the box and that we were going to be a merged tribe. I just never in a million years predicted. Well, 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 they still haven't merged. Corinne is on the cursed Fong tribe, but the swap does work in their favor as both tribes have Coda up three to two. She is with Randy and Charlie, whereas Marcus is with Susie and Bob. At their new camp, Corinne, Randy, and Charlie talk about whether to vote off Maddie or Sugar first from their tribe. Charlie says there is a slim chance Sugar could have the idol after going to exile five times, so let's just do Maddie. They then debate on whether to throw the next immunity to secure Marcus making it to the merge, and on the off chance, Susie flips on him. But at the immunity challenge, they don't really get a chance to do that because this one is more individual. Crystal drops out after literally one second and Maddie single-handedly wins it for them. They didn't have a choice to throw it or not. Episode eight has me asking, why aren't we merged yet? And why are we going to do another reward challenge? So when the new Coda walks in to the challenge. Getting your first look at the new Coda. Marcus voted out oh at the last God. tribal council. Corinne, you look miserable. I'm pissed, yeah. He didn't deserve to leave the game. And who does? Who does deserve to leave the game? Marcus is gone because Susie flipped. Wow. All of a sudden they went from being up six to four to being down four to five. 
just like that. They then win reward in super messy fashion as Randy fights with everyone over a simple task and on said reward, they get a feast with the locals and... And then we went to the next tribal ceremony and this little girl, she was very, very cute. She was like too small to like follow everybody and like hang out. So I paid some attention to her and then she was like lewd to me, which was cute. Um, but I'd be the last person anyone would think would like chum up to a two year old. The dancers were great. I kind of got the feeling one of them liked me. I haven't had a girl come on to me in about 20 years, but I think, uh, I think one of them kind of liked me. I hate to dance. My feet hurt, my knee hurts, my shoulder hurts. And I just ate about four pounds of food, but hell, I danced with her. But believe it or not, come the immunity challenge, they are finally merged. It's about time, Survivor. Susie goes on to win individual immunity, so Corinne's gonna have to wait to vote her off for now. And back at camp, Sugar says, to align with you, Corinne, I want to vote off Randy. And Corinne says, could we not? Not only do I have to act interested in what Sugar's saying, but I have to act like I care about her. Sugar is so weak and naive and, and gullible. I've been nasty to her for 25 days. I was nice to her one day and she's sold. So it doesn't even make sense, but she buys it because she's such a moron. I think this is a good appeal by Corinne and obviously on paper it makes sense. Voting off Randy but acquiring Sugar leaves them in almost the same spot they are already in. We then see Susie, Crystal and Maddie say, we need to break up Charlie and Corinne with Maddie saying, Corinne's personality is simply awful. Now mind you, he only spent a few days with her and he's already saying this. So at Tribal Council, everyone goes to vote and will Sugar flip to them or not? First vote, who cast this vote? Uh, CC, Crystal Cox. Crystal. 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 Charlie. 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 Tenth person voted out of Survivor Gabon and the second member of our jury. Charlie. Charlie, tribe has spoken. Corinne is now in a horrible spot. Down three to five, she says her, Bob, and Randy are screwed unless they can make some big moves. The Marcus vote out really did in their entire game plan, so her and Randy talk about what their next move should be. I don't like any of these people. I hate them. And, and I hate them. Don't even bother trying to be nice to Sugar, you know, just keep away from them and work on Patty. Or maybe I meant her and Randy are just gonna call everyone idiots. Same thing at this point. Their tree mail then indicates that they will be participating in the amazing Survivor auction next. And Corinne says, I need some sort of an advantage, so I'm gonna use every dollar I have to get one. At the auction, the feud between Randy and Sugar heats up as Sugar screws with him multiple times, including taking his cookie and giving it to Maddie. Randy is peeved. But more importantly for Corinne, Inside this sealed bottle is a note. This note gives you a huge advantage in the next immunity challenge. All 500. Sold to Corinne for $500. Hope it was worth it. Previously, we've seen a challenge advantage pop up in an auction in season 11 when Danny acquired it and used it to win her immunity and saved herself from elimination. And if you know the rest of the Danny story, that was a big deal. Corinne is hoping for the same fate here. Back at camp, Randy says, I think Bob might have the idol since he has now gone to exile twice and he's really smart. So my plan is to purposely be a jerk to everyone so they vote for me and then I'll play Bob's idol and vote who I want out of this game. This is of course a crap plan, a band-aid plan, if you will, for Randy's severed arm problem, but whatever, this is a Corinne video, not a Randy video. Meanwhile, Corinne tries to talk strategy to Maddie, but he doesn't care since we earlier learned he hates her personality. We then see Randy flip out on people by cursing them and saying, Maddie, you're whoring yourself out to win this game. I mean, Randy's really going off the deep end here. It's, it's fun, but not really, but it is fun, but not really. At the immunity challenge, it is Corinne's chance to save herself and... You will sit out for the first stage of this challenge and move directly into the final round. Go! Your job is to arrange those puzzle blocks like a nice line of dominoes. We're in making a lot of progress. Question is, have you spaced them properly? 
Kenny coming on strong now. Suddenly, Kenny's nearly complete. Do not panic. Take your time. Everybody has their blocks moving. Who's going to finish first? Does he go, Corinne? No, Corinne stops short. Kenny wins immunity. She blew it. Back at camp, she asked Bob if he has the idol, and he says, yeah. I have the idol, which is great. She says, please give it to Randy and buy us all one more tribal to hopefully flip this game back to us. Bob then talks to Randy, gives him an idol, and at tribal council, everyone goes to vote. I'm holding this up for a minute before I start, so it seems like I'm explaining why I'm voting Randy. You have made my life hell from day one. To get you, go home, goodbye. If anybody has the hidden immunity idol and you want to play it, now would be the time to do so. Thank you. This is not a hidden immunity idol. <laughs> I think that Randy oh, would fall for it. Sugar wants to play the joke on Randy. My life expectancy is a little bit better off, allowing her to have the satisfaction of me giving Randy the, the idol. I get nothing to lose. Randy is an ass, and I loathe him with every inch of my being. First vote. Randy. Susie. Randy. Susie. That's three votes, Susie. Randy. Randy. 11th person voted out of Survivor Gabon and the third member of our jury. Randy. Randy, tribe has spoken. Well then, Bob and Sugar trick them. I thought Bob was on uh, Corinne's side, but apparently not. As it turns out, Sugar has the real idol, and in fact, she did find it her first time going to exile in episode two. But in bigger news, Bob flipped too, so now Corinne is an island. And I don't think she is capable of a Terry slash Ozzy slash Tom Westman type of an immunity run that she kind of needs right now. Bob then reams out Sugar for laughing at Randy when they tricked him, and I think he's just feeling quite guilty. But in bigger news, the Corinne and Sugar rivalry heats up. Corinne, you talk about people all the time behind their back, and then to their face, Sugar, you act like a really a sweet thing. little girl with a little bow on your head. Come I'm on. Not acting like a sweet girl. If I told everybody to their face what I said behind their back, I wouldn't be playing a very good game, would I? Well, you shouldn't be talking about people behind their back. Why you not? It's Survivor. You don't come here to make friends. You come here to play the game. You said right. it yourself. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head, Corinne. We're here to play the game, and we're playing the game. I am, in general, I'm a nice person to people I like. I am now in a camp of mutants, none of whom I like. So it's very difficult for me to pretend to be nice to them. That's not something I'm used to, and that's done. Sugar is a very emotional person along with Maddie, so this kind of public blow up is only going to hurt Corinne's chances of working with them in the future, or even possibly getting their jury vote if she were to reach the final three. We then see Jeff shill for the already outdated Samsung Instinct by Sprint TM and says, on this are messages from home. And unlike with the letters earlier this season, this actually causes Corinne to cry. But for the reward challenge, two teams are selected by the players with Corinne not being selected by anyone, so she can't compete. Bob ends up winning, and back at camp, he brings along his wife and... Oh my God! <laughs> Seeing my brother and seeing somebody who loves me and who knows me and who gets my sense of humor and who knows how mean I am and loves it was such a cool, like just, I was overcome with emotion. I don't mention secret scenes in story videos typically if at all, but I wanna briefly point out that they chose to cut out a scene where Corinne goes full villain when talking about the players left in the game. I'm gonna show it to you, but remember this was cut from the show, so I'm not gonna count it towards any of the character or strategic moments because I think the show was keeping it out to keep the family visit light and sweet and not whatever Corinne is doing here. And we've been living in that for the last, I don't know, 
covered head, so there was no food for the first, like there's no food for the first three days or water. I lost a lot of weight. Really? Thank you. <laughs> Having my brother as a new face come in to camp and being able to tell him all the things on my mind and have him, you know, understand where I'm coming from was awesome. I can't believe you actually get to see where I live. This is crazy. So you can go back and tell everybody. So are you like a changed person from this? No. And that's you're supposed, brilliant to, you're supposed to be like a like you're supposed to be totally different. Yeah, like you see things differently well, thinking, and you're like growing and yeah, maturing yeah, as a person. Yeah, yeah. No. I, I no. I have more hate than ever in me. As if I wasn't already an angry person. Um, I wish you would have met the people that I liked that were here before. Until I got here, I was perfectly happy. Like I was having a ball when mm -hmm. I got here and I wanted to kill these people. These people are such losers. But the one Mexican lady. She's never shut up. And then like the little Asian kid, he's never had a girlfriend, he's never had a kiss. He's 22 years old. You know that one sugar? She's the one I hate the most. Huh? You see what she looks like? She claims to be a pinup as well. A pinup. For what? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I liked it. Wouldn't you like the nup? I'm around people 24 hours a day that I can't stand. So when I got my brother alone and I was dishing out to him, I mean, I was on the floor laughing with my brother because he totally gets it. I mean, I could go on and on. And then the other thing is these people, they're, they're always trying to see like the bright side of things, which I like it better. Like, misery loves company. Like, me and the people I was yeah. with are like this. So, I mean, that's more my style. <laughs> I'll let you make the call. By leaving the scene out, are they keeping the family visit light and sweet, which is what I think, or are they just trying to keep Corinne a bit more likable? Your choice. She then talks to Bob who says this may be a good time to blindside Maddie. Corinne is like, yeah, absolutely. Though she still needs to win immunity, and guess what? She doesn't, because Bob wins it. Back at camp, everyone says, yep, Corinne is next. No question about it. But then Bob has a crazy plan that just might work. Remember when we threw the idol into the ocean. Yes. Did you know that he had the idol in his pocket when he came back and hit it around camp and showed me where it was? And that's a legit idol? No, but it sounded oh. pretty good, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it did sound good. The story is this. Marcus got the idol. You were the only person that knew about it. I have, I've never known about it. Right. If you hadn't gotten immunity tonight, you would have used it for yourself. Right. But you got immunity, and the only way to keep yourself in this game is to give it to me so that I'm still in the game and to take out the strongest player being Maddie. If they think I'm going to play the idol, they're not going to want to vote me. God, you are a conniving son. Nah, you really can't say anything. I promise. Okay. I swear. So, you remember when they threw the idol out into the ocean? Uh -huh. We're taking out Maddie, and that's it. So, you may end up going home, but I know I'm not. This has definitely changed the game, and uh, I think the best shot is to blindside Maddie right now. We come up with a ridiculously harebrained scheme that shouldn't work at all and it might actually work, which is so mind-blowing. It just shows you the level of like incompetence that we're playing with. Now in this video, we haven't talked about Kenny at all, but his storyline has been showing how he is smart, a bit arrogant, and really desperate for a hot girl. Now Corinne, of course, is a hot girl physically, and I wonder how much of this is affecting his thinking here. He then talks to Crystal about this idea, and she says, that is solid, let's do it but she seems to be up in the air on whether to vote up Maddie or Corinne. So at Tribal Council, everyone goes to vote and... First vote, Maddie. Corinne, one vote Maddie, one vote Corinne. Maddie, two votes Maddie. Maddie, Corinne, two votes Corinne. Corinne, that's three votes Corinne. Twelfth person voted out of Survivor Gabon and the fourth member of our jury. Corinne. Corinne? Tribe has spoken. Time for the go. Well, that was something else. Was Corinne an explosive villain? More towards the back half of her time in Gabon as she started slow, but yeah. Strategically, if you think about it, her game hinged on Marcus. And as soon as he was gone, she was toast. She had no backup plan. She wasn't really willing to do much else. So when plan A didn't work out, she was kind of donezo. And even if her plan did work out, even if she did reach the end with Marcus, what was she gonna do? I don't think she was gonna win. At best, she gets second place. But we have to ask, what happens right after she's voted off and she goes to Ponderosa? Well, Corinne is salty. Color me surprised. It was the right time for me. I didn't want to be in the game anymore. I just didn't want to play with those people. And I was like beelining it out of there, just hoping to see Marcus, Charlie, and Randy. Those are like the the three people I like most in the game that I'm now gonna get to spend the next however many days with. Not to mention there are, you know, five people I can't stand going back to a 
flea mosquito infested camp. 33 out of 39 days ain't bad. It's exactly how it was in high school, right? There's the cool, popular, intelligent kids, which would be me and my friends. And then there's the mutant losers, and that would be these people. I was like, yes! And like, I ran like a bat out of hell over there, and I just, I just couldn't wait to feel the love. I, I saw them, and it was just like, welcome home, like the embrace, the, Ah, uh, here's the cool, attractive, smart, fun people I remember that actually like me. You know, I'm sorry that none of us can take home the million, but if taking home the million meant I had to align myself with Sugar, Crystal, Susie, or any of those people, I swear to God, they can keep the million. No. It's not working, what do I do? Oh my God. I could only blow dry my hair for about eight to 10 seconds before it would cut out, and I'd have to wait 15 seconds for it to like re-up. Come on! So it was extremely annoying. They just... This is really... Really annoying. Like everything when I got off this damn show. Nothing works, the food sucks. It's not exactly the love luxury. And it's my first tribal, I wanna look good. Really, do yourself a favor, don't come to Africa. Nothing redeeming about Africa. Nothing. Annoying. You gotta say, Curran brings the drama inside and outside the game, even being a big reason why there is a Fong versus Coda split post game, which is pretty bad when you're on Ponderosa and everyone's supposed to just be chilling. Yet Curran is driving a wedge between them. But how do I know she is being that bad? When Randy says she is taking it too far, then you know. Before we move on to her next time playing, I would be remiss not to show the moment during final tribal council of this season that completely solidifies Curran as a villain that no one will ever forget. Susie, I have one question for you, and if you can answer yes to this question, I will give you my million dollar vote. If you get the money, will you agree to have your vocal cords removed? <laughs> Sugar, you are an unemployed, uneducated leech on society, and the only thing I would vote to give you is a handful of antidepressants so that no one else has to be subjected to your constant crying anymore. And maybe if you got some, then it would seem a little more sincere when you are crying about your dead father. You don't deserve the million. Was that completely out of line or justified? You be the judge. However, Survivor does have her come back to play, not on season 20 Heroes vs. Villains as you might expect, but in season 26 Fans vs. Favorites 2. How is Corinna favorite you might be asking? Well, as she says in her preseason interview, I don't think I'm a fan favorite. I think most fans hate me. It's probably a position most people wouldn't really want to be in. It doesn't bother me because I don't have anything to do with fans. I live a very normal life and I, doesn't, I don't really care. I don't read blogs as no bearing on my life. Um, but I don't think I'm a fan favorite. I think I'm a fan least favorite, which makes me a producer favorite. I think there's a difference. So can Corinne do it this time? Can she shake off the perception she has built as a mean, evil villain and become someone who could win at the end? Can she tone down the villainy and outwit, outplay, and outlast all these kooky returnees and bland newbies? Well... 39 days, 20 people, one survivor! Survivors doing it, their first ever sequel season, Fans vs. Favorites 2. Half new players the show tries to convince us are all fans, and half returnees that the show tries to convince us are all fan favorites. Jeff describes Corinne as someone who likes to make enemies, and yeah, that's it. That's, that's all they give us. They show us the sugar clip, and that's it. That's how you know Corinne is a fan favorite, apparently. As the returning players arrive, some of them draw excitement from the newbies, but when Corinne steps out of the copter, yeah, no one, and I do mean no one, makes any celebratory noise for her. Right away, they are given a physical reward challenge for Flint and a bag of beans, and guess what? Corinne and Malcolm get the last point that nets the favorites the win. Maybe this is it. Maybe this is her redemption story. Upon arriving at their camp, former federal agent question mark Philip Shepard starts dictating what everyone should be doing around camp, and basically, this season, he's trying to be like Boston Rob. I mean, he says it like 50 times, so in case you didn't know yourself, uh, he tells you that's what he's doing. But nonetheless, he does offer her an alliance. This is important. Okay, tell me. What I would like to try to do with you, get an alliance early, and then I want to get uh, Malcolm and Andrea. I'm in. I okay. love it. I've given everyone a name. You're a dominatrix. 
Corinne is a Jake Carge kind of person. We wanted to do like us okay. and then fill out us being the stronger people so right. that we don't totally suck. Yeah, I'm for it. Can I have your attention, please? I just want to say it's so great to be here as the specialist, the dominatrix <laughs> and true grit I like that. here to solve a mission that few would dare take on to beat the heck out of the fans. Here we go, Stealth R Us 2.0. This can't last, right? I also need to mention that Brandon Hans is back this season after being a bit of a nut in South Pacific, and he's come back here with a vengeance after being made fun of by his uncle, Russell Hans. People are kind of tiptoeing around him. They're like, ah, how should we handle Brandon? Uh, is he gonna be nice today? Is he gonna be crazy today? As we see in the secret scene when he wants to hug Cochran, and Cochran's like, ah, which Brandon is this today? For them, it's a constant struggle of, am I interacting with the nice, sweet Brandon or the crazed off the handle Brandon? Either way, they lose immunity and back at camp, Francesca, the first boot of her original season says, hey, let's vote off Corinne. She's being far too nice to everyone. Yes, that is right. Corinne is being targeted for being too nice. Oh, how the tables have turned. So at tribal council. First vote, Andrea. Andrea. Three votes, Andrea. Andrea. That's four votes, Andrea. Francesca. Two votes, Francesca. That's three votes, Francesca. Francesca. We're tied. Francesca. First person voted out of Survivor fans versus favorites. Francesca. Francesca, the truck spoken. Again. Okay. <laughs> Corinne voted for Francesca, and that was a huge vote. Why? Because back at camp, Brandon Hans has shifted gears from being nice and sweet to flying off the handle. He thinks Andrea should have gone, and voting out Francesca first was just cruel. He says, Don Cochran, you're going to lose this game due to this one move. But then the next day, Brandon and Philip are at odds, and... I'm gonna be honest with you guys. Philip is probably the biggest bully I've ever met in my life. Wait, what? He's what? making me feel like really uncomfortable. Like, Wait, who why? Is he? He's calling himself the CEO of the tribe. I'm on a need to know basis. You guys couldn't trust me because of my last season. That's why you didn't tell me to vote for last night. And I have a feeling that's gonna happen again. Like, I'm just saying. You don't want to fight with me! It's Special Agent Pink Panther was freaking Inspector Gadget thought he could pull his uh, special agent tricks. And that's gonna be his downfall in this game. The simple fact of the matter is, it's like he's treating people like garbage. I think he's starting to Boston rob us a little bit. I, and I don't like that. You gotta cut the head off the snake. And I'm not going anarch, like if he's the leader, I'm not trying to Listen, throw a- Listen, not any kind of leader. The favorites then win immunity. So we move on to episode three, and I need to mention a couple of things. One is that Brandon and Philip are the worst. They're constantly at odds. But number two is that Corinne hasn't had a single confessional all season. I'm not sure why, especially considering the premiere was an hour and a half long. But yeah, her first confessional is not until here in episode three. In our large alliance of six, there's an interesting dynamic that Andrew and Philip have both played together and have a connection, and Cochran and Don have both played together and have a connection. So that really just left Malcolm and I, and we sort of gravitated towards each other. He's like super smart, went to an Ivy League school, like he's got his head on his shoulders. And you know, it doesn't hurt to have somebody good looking around. No way. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not thrilled that Corinne knows I'd be idol. Of, co of course, in a perfect world, I'd have it all to myself. But Corinne does know about it. And she's somebody that luckily I did have, you know, a good relationship early on in this game. Just the two of us. Nobody knows? Nobody knows. Okay. Done. This is huge. Malcolm has the idol. Yes, not Corinne. But these two are now bonded and she knows where the idol is. And Malcolm has made zero indication he wants Corinne gone, especially for being too nice or something silly like that. We then see them talk privately as the camera cuts to Cochran, who says he has no idea where Corinne's loyalties lie. And then Andrea says, I want Corinne out. Now, I personally suspect that this Corinne targeting is all pregame stuff. She has done nothing in the season to have this many people target her. So whatever the issue is that they have with her must be before the game ever started on the island. Such is the life of a villain. Brandon hears about Andrea wanting Corinne gone and says if anyone targets him, then he's going to pee in the rice and beans. Wow. Just wow. Thankfully, the favorites do win immunity. And then in episode four, they win it again. So we slide in episode five and Brandon volunteers something a bit wild. And I have such a passion for my family. 
I'd give my life a thousand times in the most horrific way just to see my, my wife and my kids. Every day is a waste. So, uh, uh, next tribal council, if we have to go to tribal council, I'll, I'm volunteering for you to vote me out of the game. It really hurts my pride to have to, you know, admit all these stupid things, but I was about to light the whole thing on fire. I'm glad you didn't do that. And I way was, to choose the I'll, other option. I was gonna pee in the beans and rice. Okay, yeah, I'm glad that. <laughs> it turns out Brandon's alternative to telling us he was gonna quit was he was going to burn the shelter down and or pee in our beans and rice. I want him off my camp immediately. He's loco, for sure. Clearly he's spinning out of control. It's just a matter of time, and it's a matter of like, what does that mean for everyone around him? Like, what's he gonna do? Um, okay, he wants to go home, fine. But then the very next morning he says, nah, I wanna stay. Dude, make up your mind and just stick to it. He says he is now going to be the most intense Brandon he can be, and I'm sure everyone's like, please, don't do that. I mean, I personally can't see how that could be good. We then see a secret scene between him and Eric where Brandon says if anyone turns on him and Eric, he is going to go nuclear and burn this camp down. So uh, on a lighter note, the favorites win reward and back at camp, Philip is taking all the credit for the win, despite the fact that he basically did half of the work with Brandon. This does not go over well, and Brandon confronts Philip, who tells him to get over it, so. I think we can all agree that Brandon is definitely unstable and unpredictable. What are you supposed to do with that? It's just, I don't know what to do with it. This Philip and Brandon rivalry, it's getting to me. I woke up this morning, who starts the fire? Brandon starts the fire. Who's the only dude in this tribe who can start a fire with a piece of flint? Brandon. So I don't need no old 54 year old punk bitch telling me don't bite the hand that feeds you. He doesn't feed me. I'm a hands. I feed me. No, Brandon, Come on, Brandon. Brandon. Brandon, help now. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Hey, Phil. Here's a reason to vote me out, you little... Huh? With your stealth all rust, bull... Huh? I'm the author of my fate, buddy. I'm the author of my fate. We realize that this is going to be a challenge for immunity, and it's for that reason that we're going to forfeit the challenge so that we may go to tribal. While we're all really fierce competitors, we have some discourse within our camp and we would like to hash that out in the appropriate setting. We respect this game and we hope that both you and the fans can respect our decision to go to tribal. Let me help you out a little bit, okay? They don't respect anything about the fans. That's bull Corinne. Complete bull Okay, Brandon. Don't play, miss, I'm cool with the fans, period. And Philip speaks so highly of himself. Stop talking about yourself. Boston Rob took you to the end of the game. You didn't do anything. You were made fun of. And you come here and you tell me, don't bite the hand that feeds you? I feed myself. You need to grow up. You need to shut up. OK, why don't we just cut to the chase? We're having tribal council right now. You good with this? I'm good with it. All right, six person voted out of this game. Brandon Hans. Good riddance. Brandon was a loose cannon who shouldn't have passed whatever medical checks they have before coming on the show. Episode 6 sees the favorites worried that Brandon might have given the fans a bit too much hope on his way out the door, but more importantly for Corinne is how she doesn't like how no one defended her or Philip from Brandon's attack. Philip, I get, no one likes him, but yeah, no one defending Corinne might be saying a lot about her position in this tribe. Philip then says with Brandon gone, Corinne is next, I mean geez. Can she catch a break? Well, the answer is maybe. As Jeff says, drop your buffs. We are swapping tribes. Corinne ends up staying on the purple Bacall tribe with Cochran, Don, and Philip. Oh boy, Philip. We all love Philip. And they are joined by Matt, Julia, and Michael from the fans. Despite Philip still being there, she is ecstatic about this change. Why? Hello, you can Philippines. Make it <laughs> oh, do I have a special place in my heart for a gay? If I wasn't a moron and hadn't played this game before, I would turn on my entire alliance just to align with the gay. That's how much I like gays. However, I can't do that because I know at least none of my people are gonna flip, that's for sure. I'm not going to show every time she says she loves the gays, as she calls it, but it definitely gets into the double digit range. Despite having a four to three lead on their tribe over the fans, 
Philip talks to Julia and says, you need to flip or else. And then when he tells Kern and Dawn, they're like, what the heck? Why? We don't need Julia. We don't need to threaten her into flipping. We then see Matt show off his tattoos in a secret scene, which are works of art in comparison to what Brandon had. And Corinne says, this is a guy I would be friends with outside of this game. They then lose immunity in a blowout. And back at Camp Phillips says, Corinne isn't good at anything except keeping her body in shape. Phillips a jackhole. Corinne then talks about Philip and... He's the worst federal agent I've ever met. What cases did he crack? Like, what was he working on? And is that the reason our country is in such a mess? <laughs> is the most annoying player out here, hands down. The reason why everybody keeps thinking he's the ringleader is because he does outrageous things and we all just keep quiet about it. I don't care, I know he's not the leader and I know I'm not gonna listen to him. But if he wants to have a speech when he gets back here, all right, have your speech. I mean, on a scale of like one to on an airplane next to a baby annoying. He's he's on the airplane next to the baby annoying and the baby has diarrhea. I mean, it is it is the most annoying situation you can be in. It's very frustrating, but there is little I can do about it. Because as annoying as he is, he'll vote with me and he ain't gonna flip. Despite all the talk behind Philip's back about how he isn't really the leader, people constantly give him the power, so he kind of is. He dictates what is done around camp and who does what in challenges. He is burning bridges along the way. Sure, that's for his video, but he is the leader, basically. She then talks to Matt and Michael who say, yeah, we can vote off Julia, fine by us. But then we see that Don and Cochran want Matt out. Sounds like a split to me. At Tribal Council, Corinne is far too open and honest with Jeff Probst, as she says there are at least three favorites who will go unnamed that she doesn't even like. Why would you say that, Corinne? Just keep that to yourself. So they all go to vote and... Seventh person voted out of fans versus favorites. Matt, Matt, the job is spoken. See you guys. Episode seven has Corinne saying Michael needs to stay since he is gay. And she loves the gays. I, I am not gonna mention every time she says this, just know it's quite often. Philip then gets jealous and upset when he sees Corinne hanging out with Michael all the time and not reporting to him what their conversations are about. I mean, Philip really thinks he's Boston Rob and that he's gonna do the buddy system. I, I truly think that. They then get tree mail, which says the next challenge is all about strength and everyone's like, crap, we're gonna lose. Except Philip. Philip says, I am literally stronger than anyone else in this game. Okay, Philip, okay. So at the challenge. Go! We're good. You just run. Nobody That's running. We go. Unless it's walking. The girls look tired. Can we run? No. Can we run, Philip? I think you'll tire more. Guys, they're seriously catching up. Come on, this is it. We can hustle right here. Go to slowly but very surely is catching the call who is yet to do anything but walk. Cochran and Julia are out. Karim was 60 pounds. It is over. Go to wins reward. We just lost a reward challenge, and I'm going to blame the whole thing on Philip. And Philip can take the fall for this. You tubby lunchbox. I've yet to see an ab on you. I don't see any pectoral muscles. I mean, he's a, a, a an amoeba. He's, he's, a, he's a, a loose 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound sack. I mean, he's just a mess. But everyone else sees his true colors. And like, if he blows the next challenge for us, maybe we take him out. I could have taken everybody's weights and done the entire thing myself and won it. He's the, he's the worst. He has this inflated sense of like, I'm the strongest man in the world, I'm Mr. Universe, so all the weight on me. It's so frustrating. I don't want to keep playing the game with him. Yeah. Philip and Corinne hate each other. There's so much fracture and division within the favorites on this tribe. It's like a death sentence. I mean, something is gonna happen at one point or another. Philip is 10 shades of delusional. They then lose immunity because of him as well as he struggles to throw the hook. So back at camp, the plan apparently is to split the votes between Michael and Julia in case an idol is played. Corinne says, I hate this plan. I don't want Michael getting any votes from us. So he will be on our side come the merge. But yeah, no one's listening to Corinne. What else is new this season? Philip says, I know what she is doing and I don't like it, buster. Corinne, who's in love with Michael, seems to have this notion that, oh no, 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 no. It has to be a show of unity. I don't want him thinking that we are not 100% behind him. I'm not an idiot. I played with the smartest player that I've ever had an opportunity to play with, Boston Rob, and I know exactly what BR would do in this situation. What BR would do is he'd say, okay, Corinne, we vote Michael out the game. What do we decide? You made it clear from the get-go who your choice was. 
I took all emotion out of it. I, Philip. I'm explaining what would normally you're happen. You're not letting me talk at all. Because you just walked up on a conversation I was having with the three of them. We're we're in an alliance, Philip. So what? I should be able to walk I don't come over and interrupt you. I don't interrupt you when you have a meeting. When you walk down there with Dawn, do I walk over and go, blah? You don't. I let you finish your conversation. If, you, if I say it to You're being so mean to me right now, Philip. I'm not like, being mean. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. Philip is beyond awful. Like, if this was the real world, I would kick his ass. But for me, it's a waiting game until I get to hold up that parchment and go, this is what Boston Rob would have done. You know why Corinne isn't being targeted? Straight up because Cochran tells Philip that, hey, if we vote her off, that will look bad to the other side. It will look like we're not unified come the merge. We have to stick together. At Tribal Council, Corinne says, sure, Michael is gay, which I love, but them working together should not threaten anyone. I mean, Corinne needs to pray for a merge come next episode. That's all I'm saying. So they all go to vote and... Eighth person voted out of Survivor fans versus favorites. Julia. Julia, the tribe has spoken. It is now episode eight and Corinne is celebrating. She says, mission accomplished, I saved the gay. Oh, Corinne, I am pretty sure you're one of the few who can get away with saying that over and over and over and over again. But then, plot twist, Philip says, I threw the challenge. No way. I did. There was no point in saying, Philip, I know you didn't throw the challenge. Like, just like I would say to a normal person, like, you're, you're kidding, right? Like, you didn't throw the challenge. Like, that's the biggest joke of the year. Yeah, but you could have just told us. I mean, yeah. you would have said okay. When I actually made the decision, it wasn't before. It happened in the game, like, and I was like, go for it. At the challenge. That's convenient. That's around the same time as you blew the challenge. It's times like these where you're like, yes, he's a very loyal Alliance member, but he's so cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs that there's no question that Philip has to go. Is it really throwing a challenge if you decide to throw when you start losing to the better athlete on the other tribe? I don't think so. But then something amazing happens. They finally merge. Thank goodness, as Corinne reconnects with Malcolm and they say, yeah, let's flip on the favorites and band with the newbies. After losing the gross food immunity challenge to Cochran, Philip is at camp spearheading a split vote between Eddie and Reynolds, both fans, since he wants all physical threats gone so that I guess he can win all the immunity challenges, which I don't think would happen even if all the physical threats were gone. But what's strange is why does he care about physical threats when earlier he said he was the strongest person here? But you know, whatever. Corinne suggests they vote out Sherry since she hates her. Well, why does she hate Sherry that she just met? Because Sherry apparently does too much small talk and Corinne hates small talk. Philip says, no, I am doing what Boston Rob would do, which is not voting off Sherry, it's voting off Eddie and Reynolds. Corinne, then displeased by what Philip is saying, goes and snitches to Eddie and Reynolds what he is saying. And she also throws in there that if she could, every single day she would throat punch the former special agent Question mark. Now, personally, I'm not sure why Corinne doesn't just tell Philip what he wants to hear because that would work while secretly working behind his back. But we then see a secret scene where her and Cochran are talking about strategy and I'm just like upset because I just I shouldn't be getting targeted this early on. I think that I just splitting votes, I feel like it's going to cost me my life in this game. My desperation here is to convince the favorites to all vote together, take out either Brenda or Sherry. I really don't care. You know, we'll, we'll blindside somebody. There's no long-term thinking in, in Corinne's game. It's always who has just, you know, hurt me or insulted me in some way. They need to go. You, you, you aggravate Corinne and she wants your head on a platter. If it's at all possible, just uh -huh. if we can just take Sherry out, it's an easy vote. It brings us down by one fan yeah. and then we can go for whoever you want. I can't afford this first vote to be a waste of one of the idols. No split votes. Let's feed the fire for Sherry. Sherry is a dumpster fire. I don't appreciate small talk. I don't care where you're from. I definitely don't care what your kids' names are. I don't care if they're in Little League. I hate small talk. And this broad is just small talk central. So I'm none too happy to get rid of her. I mean, just, just on a personal level. Cochran's mostly right. She isn't shambo levels of emotional decision making, but it definitely plays a large part. She then talks to Dawn about flipping, which apparently causes PTSD for Dawn, since something similar happened on her last season at the same time in the game. So they all go to tribal council and... You are one of the most selfish people I've ever met in my life. You played a good game, but unfortunately for you, I wasn't looking for applications for new friends. First vote, Sherry. Corinne. Sherry. Corinne. Sherry. Corinne. That's three votes, Corinne. Sherry. Corinne. Four votes, Corinne. Sherry. Five votes, Sherry. 
We're tied. Five votes Sherry, five votes Corinne. Corinne, six votes Corinne. Ninth person voted out of Survivor fans versus favorites. Corinne. Corinne, the tribe has spoken. Well, that sucks. Corinne went maybe half, if not less, villainous than last time, but she never stood a chance. It seemed like people had preconceived notions that she couldn't shake off, and her gameplay was marginally better than Gabon, but eh, it's kind of hard to tell when you never had a chance. But this elimination stirs up something inside of Corinne, as her and Eliza from Survivor Vanuatu and Micronesia are teamed up to be a villainous pair on The Amazing Race 31. That's right, six years later, she is back on CBS with a vengeance. This time she gets to race around the world for a million dollars and no one can vote her out. This season has three Survivor teams, one of them including Rupert, three Big Brother teams, and four Amazing Race teams. It's kind of like fans versus favorites in terms of experience levels, but way better casting. The race is starting in California where Rupert is already sucking up by going all in on the theme and saying, Survivors are tough, so they will be faster. Um, okay, Rupert, but now it is time. The world is waiting for you. Good luck. Travel safe. Go! And they're off. Their first task is to dig in this massive sand octopus for the first clue. And unfortunately, Corinne and Eliza are so slow at this task. They finish in 10th out of 11th. As it turns out, everyone is flying to Tokyo, Japan, and we finally get to catch up with them for the first time since we saw them both on Survivor. We're both pretty well-known villains on Survivor. Right. Corinne has absolutely no filter. We're both totally single. Yeah, we're not doing so hot in that area. Nope. But we don't have kids at home that we're like worried about. Oh, my kids, I miss my yeah. babies. I miss some of my like fancy shoes, that's about it. There are definitely some teams that are really easy picking. Victor and Nicole. We've so nicknamed we think, them Team Dummy. Yeah. Rupert is really old. He's got like this big pot belly. Did you save your mayonnaise? Like, he's not exactly Mr. Athletic. Right. Rachel has raced to the final leg twice, but like with we Brendan carrying her. Really her with Alyssa, good luck lips. Rachel and Alyssa look like they lost a bet. Those outfits are a lot. You're going home. Never change, you guys, never change. Despite being on the same flight with everyone, the Survivor teams are struggling the hardest, even harder than the Big Brother teams, as it takes Corinne and Eliza forever to find their next clue. And once again, they're in 10th place. But now it is time for the first roadblock. These are tasks only one player can do per team. And this one, they have to pick shoes off of walls and find the ones that are made of chocolate. We're winners. <laughs> We're not gonna lose another million. Come on, Eliza, you got this. We can't be the first ones out, oh my God. I know, I know, I know. There are so many shoes to bite into. There are only three survivor teams. If you're eliminated on the first leg, like, how do you show your faith in public again? I'll start from with the next row, the one below the one you're about to put back. Sorry, I found it, I found it! Thank I found you! It. I found All it. right, hallelujah. This isn't looking good. They get to the next roadblock and no one else is there as Corinne climbs a slippery, inflatable mountain that's supposed to represent Mount Fuji. And upon arriving at the pit stop... Corinne and Eliza, I'm sorry to tell you, you are at the back of the pack, but you are team number nine. <laughs> they barely made it. Lots of improvement will need to be made if Corinne and Eliza want to win this thing. Episode two starts and now they're flying to Laos with everyone on the same flight again, so they're all evened up. However, Corinne says, I haven't had any fun so far in this race. As my wife would say, get good scrub. On their way to the clue box, they run in the street to block the other team's tuk tuk and this just makes the Afghanimals angry, who Corinne and Eliza don't like anyways. But truly, who do Corinne and Eliza actually like? I mean, is there anyone? But now it is time for a detour, which is a choice between two tasks, each with their own pros and cons. They choose to learn the Laos alphabet and... Good teamwork, good info. Holy crap, they're in first place. What just happened? Well, I can't tell you what just happened, but what does happen next is one of the worst things that can happen to anyone on the race besides just not reading your clue. They get a bad taxi. Not only bad, but slow. It gets lost on the way to the roadblock, and despite their massive lead, they lose it to the other team thanks to the tuk-tuk driver. Corinne does end up crushing said roadblock, and they are in third place. And then again, they get a different and yet slower tuk-tuk, which causes even more teams to pass them. And by the time they get to the pit stop, they're in sixth place. How frustrating. Episode three sees them flying to Vietnam 
and again, all the teams are evened up by the flight. As everyone races to a local shop for the next clue. They say he's not here, say he's not here. Where is it, man? I'm telling you he's not here, bro. Where is the dog fix? Oh. Oh, we have to go. Leo's not here. How could this not be? They're it? lying. They're lying. They're they're liars. Yeah, yeah. They're like so okay. I don't even know why I listened. They're the biggest liars. Here. Just like in Survivor, it's not good to have enemies in the Amazing Race this early on. They can try to trick you. They can U-turn you, or simply just refuse to help you with anything. And yeah, people help each other in the Amazing Race all the time. They do find the clue in eighth place, and mind you, there's only nine teams right now. And while in the taxi, frustration sets in as Eliza talks a mad smack about their driver. While he's in the car with them, it's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. They then make a risky choice on the detour and pick the fishing task instead of dancing. And... Good? Yeah! yeah. Woo! Roadblock. Travel by taxi to Kingdom Karaoke. Wow, they're in fourth place. The risky move really paid off. They then go to the roadblock where Eliza has to learn part of a song in the local language and immediately she annoys everyone by singing badly really bad seemingly on purpose though i am not sure but she does eventually knock it out and at the pit stop corinne and eliza i am pleased to tell you that you are team number five yeah! <laughs> things are getting better and better every leg they have improved their position and are catching up to the front of the pack episode four sees them staying in vietnam and yeah they're excited about being in the middle of the pack as they say we're leaving in fifth place yep. our best yet so right there in average and mediocrity is there anything we can improve upon like from the last leg other than i don't know it seems idiotic that at the very least we couldn't be better at this than big brother anyways everyone is evened up again as they all go sledding in an indoor snow hill thing for their next clue and eliza makes a bold risky move by trying to steal rachel and Alyssa's taxi but they catch her in the act. Bad blood is a Bruin, but it gets worse as they have yet another bad taxi driver. I mean, what are the odds? And this one gets lost since he doesn't know where he is heading after lying, saying that he did. They do eventually get to the roadblock, which has Eliza needing to pass a simple scooter test and... Slow and steady. We didn't hate mopeds before. Now we really hate them. This is so terrible. Right on the footbreak. Right on the footbreak. Right. We're the last team for sure. All right, this is it. You got it. Yeah. Don't freak out. She didn't grow up in a trailer park with a freaking moped. I guess at some point I just kind of pulled it together, started like going steady. <laughs> Other people had issues with the test, but none as bad as Eliza. When they finally reach the detour, they see that there's still one other team there, Rachel and Alyssa. If they can beat them, then they are still in this thing. They choose the boat task, which is different than what the other team is doing. And this seems to be a great decision as it buys them a bunch of time, despite falling out of the boat and into the water. And upon arriving at the pit stop. I see it, Corinne, come on, I'm coming. The race is not over yet, so it's just like, we're so blessed and we, I don't want to ever take that for granted. Guess we're not blessed. Corinne and Eliza, I'm sorry to tell you, you have been eliminated from the race. We're devastated and we're so disappointed. I, I don't respect us. Like, surviving four legs is terrible. And then to have to stand there at our elimination on the mat with Rachel and Alyssa, who were like, we respect you as women. I was like, get out of here with your fake BS. Like, I have no interest in hearing from them or speaking to them ever again. I don't know. I'm not a positive person. I don't really know how to spin this. <laughs> I hate them so much. I don't ever want to see their faces again. That just sucks. I would say they had bad luck with the taxi drivers, but they entered the roadblock in fourth place and left in last. That's completely on them. Namely, Eliza. And yeah, this is the worst Corinne has ever performed on any show so far. So what do you think about Corinne Kaplan? Do you want to see her play again? Let me know down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and doubly thanks for liking and subscribing. See you all next time.